everybody uh, settle in now. My name is Chuck Strauss from the city of Austin Arbor. I'll be a moderator for the session here. The uh, usual slide, please uh, turn off or mute your cell phones, pages, any other devices you may have on you that ring, chime, sing little songs, or any such things as that. Okay. This afternoon's uh, session here is entitled, Why Does It Hurt When I Do That? Now, I think uh, most of you here at one time or another have stood there with your crook or uh, foot jammed in the crotch of a tree while you went to the back end worthy of an uh, Olympic gymnast, twisting around and you make that cut over there. And then you hit the ground and you go, why does it hurt when I do that? Well, hopefully this afternoon we're going to have some answers. Welcome to Breakout Session C. It's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Mr. Ted Tate. Ted's originally from Atlanta. He graduated from Emory University with a degree in sociology and psychology in 1992. Ted then went up to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, earned his master's degree in physical therapy. Ted is a certified ergonomic specialist from the back school in Atlanta. He certified in performance of functional capacity evaluations with the Ivan Hagen Work Systems and is an accredited Office Ergonomic Evaluator since 2004 from Atlas Ergonomics in Coralville, Iowa. Since 2004, Tom has been employed by the Advanced Physical Therapy and Sports Medicine at the Orthopedic and Sports Institute of the Fox Valley. If you realize that as an arborist, you also have to be an athlete in this profession. Professional athletes have many of the same aims as arborists. Today, Ted will explain the philosophy and the benefits of ergonomics. He will review the musculoskeletal disorders. He will give us an overview of the musculoskeletal system and anatomy. And finally, we'll tie it all together tighter than a place is so that we can all understand the importance of staying physically tuned and in proper working order so that we can perform our job duties safely, efficiently, and without pain in a career that will last longer, hopefully, than by far. <laughs> So please, everybody, welcome me and uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Ted Tate. Thank you. Um, actually, before I proceed, I want to let you guys know I do have some uh, brochures up here uh, from where I work, um, Advanced Physical Therapy and Sports Medicine and uh, Orthopedic and Sports Institute of the Fox Valley. We have uh, 10 doctors and also 10 physical therapists who can help you. Um, we also do free 15-minute injury screening. So if any of you have any kind of uh, pains or aches, just give, give us a call. <clears throat> call our front office, and we'll uh, do our best we can to get you in and do that screen and see where we go from there. So it'll cost you nothing to give us a call and just see, see why you're hurt. OK? Um, also, I have uh, my card up here, which has our number on it, and also uh, our card for Orthopedic and Sports Institute of the Fox Valley with Diane Dappern, who's our case manager. We're, um, how many uh, employers do we have here? Okay. All right, what makes us different with uh, Orthopedic and Sports Institute is that we actually have an occupational health workers' comp coordinator. Okay. So we truly are your uh, one-stop shop. When you come in, you know, a lot of times they'll get people and they'll get, kind of get caught up in the system. And, uh, you know, they'll have to go this place or that place or, you know, somewhere else to kind of find out different information. With our work comp coordinator, what we do, if you did get to that point, um, you know, where you're actually signed up as a patient with us, you have all of your information in one place. So you don't have to run all over the place trying to figure out, you know, uh, is Sue supposed to be here, or Steve supposed to be here, or where, you know, where did he work, or how did he get injured, or it was a date of injury. So this is you know, for employers who are uh, concerned about that. That kind of speeds up the process. Okay? So uh, maybe uh, toward the end or somewhere around here, you can sneak around and grab one of the cards. Okay, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna step on this side. This be better. Okay, uh, thanks for having me to the Arborist Association here, the annual convention. Um, again, I just wanted to let you know, we do have a free 15-minute injury screening. Um, you can also go to our uh, website, 
uh, www.advancedptsportsmedicine.com and, and www.osisv.com. We are a, uh, I thought this would be important for everybody, we are a green organization, so that's why you don't have any handouts today, if you're wondering, okay? Um, what I'm going to do is uh, make this PowerPoint available on our website. Um, I also do have some uh, exercises that, uh, videos, the exercises, that if you wanted to go there, you can access them on our website. Uh, there will be a charge for, you know, a small charge for uh, the exercises. If you're an employer, you can, you know, possibly uh, get that for your employees at a small uh, price and uh, actually have one person take them through the exercises or, you know, a couple people. Um, let's move on here. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Why does it hurt? Okay, that's what everybody wants to know. Uh, and uh, why should you be concerned about why something hurts? In the physical therapy profession, we call that ergonomics. Okay, ergonomics is... is uh, looking at the natural laws of how your body works and how it relates to, in this case, how you get up and down that tree, okay? So uh, basically, we're concerned about that. Can everybody see over here? Am I standing in front of you? you okay? Okay. Uh, we're concerned about that because we want you to get through a day's work without overusing your body. Uh, we also are concerned about your quality of life, okay? We want you to have enough energy left, left over to enjoy your life after your work day is over. Who's all for that? Okay. <laughs> so, so we're all working together here. Okay, uh, why should employers be concerned about ergonomics? Well, a happier worker is often a more productive worker. Um, cost containment, uh, the musculoskeletal disorders lead to excessive medical costs, time off work, and disability, which, as I was saying, if we have all of that in one place where we can keep track of it, we can serve your needs better if you're an employer. Okay? Okay, so what is the employer's responsibility? Okay. Uh, basically, to provide a safe work environment for your employees, uh, determine the safety-related variables that can and cannot be controlled, and take steps to limit or reduce the impact of control controllable variables contrib contributing to the development of musculoskeletal injuries. So, uh, this would be an example of something that's kind of out of control. If you were an employer of this guy, it's kind of hard to keep your variables from changing here, okay? <laughs> so, bull rider. Okay, this would be an example of a job with fewer variables, or fewer, more controllable va variables, uh, be office workers or mill workers. Okay. Uh, control of var controllable variables in this case of an arborist employer would be the equipment and tools to perform the job. And I'll just give you some examples of some tree climbing equipment, which you guys, a lot of you probably are already very familiar with. Uh, this, I, I, I pulled this one uh, off the net on purpose, because I wanted to show you it's an example of um, thinking in this realm, thinking that, uh, you know, you can have a harness, but you can also have uh, what we call the tree flex harness, which is designed to allow you to function the way you were meant to function, to have your legs free, and you have the independent articulating design leg loops, and uh, also it allows you to distribute some of the weight if you're sitting there or climbing on your pelvic girdle. It's not just on one place where you can get an ouch, you know, or pain. Uh, this is just some examples, again, uh, Buckingham climber foot plates. Again, I'm not trying to sell you the name brand. I'm just using this as an example of uh, some of the um, safety uh, features that an employer can use. Uh, some of the Buckingham climber shields that keep you from, uh, you know, obviously poking yourself with your spur or your gaff. I think that's what you guys call it. Um, also, that with the climber foot plates, it allows you to be able to keep your foot in a neutral position when you're climbing up the tree rather than turning it in or out. The more you have something in a neutral position, the less you're likely to stress it or have it get injured. Okay, some other examples, some chest ascenders, foot ascenders, hand ascenders. Uh, these are dual purpose. You can go up and down with these lock jack, sport, and spider. Uh, dual purpose, the senders and descenders. Um, a lot of these are designed, the hand ascenders and the foot ascenders are designed to keep your hands and your feet in a neutral position, in the position they were meant to work in. Okay, make it less, less uh, likely for you to get an injury. Uh, here are some uh, descenders. Uh, again, the friction savers, uh, the less force you have to put in climbing the rope or getting up the tree, uh, the less likely you're going to have a musculoskeletal disorder also. Okay, uh, I wanted to show you this. This is an example of someone not taking care of themselves outside of work. 
<laughs> okay? Uh, so it's important that you take care of yourself outside of, what you do outside of work is just as important as what you do in. Okay? Uh, this is an example of somebody taking care of themselves, uh, or taking care of themselves outside of work. Michael Jordan, a lot of people don't realize that he actually signed a contract where um, he, he loves to ride motorcycles. And when he was playing with the Chicago, Chicago Bulls, he couldn't ride motorcycles. He signed a contract because it was too dangerous to do that. So this is an example of he's, now he's, he's done, so he can ride, you know. So he's got his own line of motorbikes called the Jordans. A little trivia for you this, morning, this afternoon. Okay, so uh, how do you as workers uh, meet the responsibility of uh, taking care of yourself? All right, and that's where I come in. As your physical therapist, I'm your coach, and you apply the principle of uh, personal ergonomics. I'm going to stand over here because I want to feel like I'm talking to everybody. Okay. Um, again, uh, you are a professional industrial athlete, and uh, you're committed to reducing the physical stress, again, while pr improving your work performance. So, uh, okay, so what can you learn from me, physical therapist? What you can learn from coming over and seeing us? Uh, basically, how your body works mechanically. Uh, if you were uh, driving a car and you wanted to find out how the best way to fix it, you would go to a mechanic. Same thing with your body. Body, you're moving it every day, and you know certain things about it. But uh, we've gone to school for a lot of years to uh, be able to tell you uh, how, to, how it works better or how it works the best. Uh, demand your, uh, you can learn from us to demand your body faces on the job. We look at this in a very unique way. Uh, we look at it from a functional standpoint. We look at repetitive stress. We look at, uh, you know, how much weight you're lifting. Uh, we look at awkward postures, things that you may not even think about when you're doing it. You're just getting the job done, okay? Uh, how to use your body with the least amount of physical stress, again, we look at it that way. And how to take care of your body, mind, and spirit is irreplaceable tools, so we, we value that. All right, your body's musculoskeletal system. Now, what I, uh, what I want you to take away from this is that you hear these terms, okay, from me, that they're not so uh, foreign the next time you hear them. If you go into a doctor's office, sometimes it feels like you're, they're speaking, you know, talking Greek, not speaking English. You know, you hear d different terms, and I want you, if you go into a doctor's office, go in our office, you hear somebody put a diagnosis on something, you go, you know, I heard that once before. You don't have to remember exactly what it was, but I don't want you to be kind of, okay, I heard that, I'm familiar with it. So that's what this is about. So don't let some of the terms, you know, kind of make your eyes roll back in your head. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, Go through this pretty good and uh, try to bring it down to earth for you, okay? All right. Uh, basically, we're just talking about the general components of the system. Uh, bones are your body's hard support structures. Joints are where two bones come together and movement happens, okay? <laughs> Ligaments connect, connect the bone to the bone and permit movement. And ligament injuries can cause joints to be damaged or unstable. Uh, muscles are designed to produce movement, as you all know. Your muscles attach to your bones by the tendons, causing the movement at the joint by contraction. Uh, your bursa, a lot of people don't know about bursa. You have actually lubricating sacs uh, in your joints and in between some of your muscle fibers to keep them working well. We were talking about engines, car engines. It's like a WD-40 in your engine, okay? Uh, tendonitis, if you go to the doctor and they say tendonitis, obviously it looks like it's, anytime you see itis, it's an inflammation. It's an inflammation of a tendon, okay? Uh, tenosynovitis, you have a sheath around your tendon that covers it, that that can get inflamed too, okay? And uh, I just talked to you about bursa, uh, bursa, put the itis on it, inflammation of a bursa. So I mean, I took something that sounds, hopefully with you guys, it sound, you know, when you went in there and they said, he said I had bursitis or tendonitis. Now you can kind of put it together. You say, well, I hear itis on the end and I hear bursa, you know, so you can put it together what it is. Uh, a neuralgia is a nerve irritation. Okay, how many of you uh, have gotten up in the morning and your hand falls asleep? Okay, uh, that would be about like a neuralgia would feel. You know, you're tingling, numbness, maybe a little bit of burning. Um, the nerves get, take information from your extremities and take them back to the spinal cord. It's just like a way station. It says, okay, this is happening here and lets you know where they are in space. Okay, ischemia, if you hear a doctor says ischemia, that means some of the blood supply is cut off to that area. So... Everybody with me? I don't see any eyes rolling back in head, so you're doing good. Okay, let's talk about the shoulder. 
this is the area I really wanted to focus on because besides this, besides the, uh, like I say, the ankle taking a lot of bearing, bearing a lot of weight, your shoulder takes a lot of brunt being an arborist and climbing the ropes. Okay, uh, this is your shoulder. Okay, a lot of people think your shoulder is just here. Okay, you're looking at the arm bone here. Let me use this pointer. It's just here. But your shoulder is actually your uh, clavicle, which is your collarbone, your scapula, which is your shoulder blade, and your humerus. Okay? These three working together allow you to be able to lift your arm up. And that's the front part of the shoulder. So this would be a right shoulder if somebody was facing you this way. Okay, this is the back part of the shoulder. just wanted to give you a different view. Am I blocking anybody? Everybody can see okay? Yeah. This is a different view. Uh, again, you got your collarbone, clavicle, scapula, and your humerus. Okay? And I'll explain to you what those parts on the side are here in a second. Um, one of the problems that you have with your shoulders, you've got this big arm bone that has to stay in this small area. So you've got to find a way to keep it together. And the only thing to hold your shoulder together is your ligaments and your uh, tendons and your muscles. Uh, when, you're, when you're standing on your hip, you can actually, you know, your body weight from your hip actually helps hold it in the group. But with your shoulders just hang in there. So I, I wanted to uh, play up the fact that you've got some ligaments here in the front of your shoulder that help hold it in place. I've seen guys who are really strong. You know, they have great, big, you know, these power lifters who have, you know, really strong uh, pecs, delts, traps. They come in there and their shoulders loose as can be. Uh, it's because you have uh, your internal structures, your ligaments, and your muscles hold everything together so it moves the way it's supposed to. Okay? Okay. Uh, again, this is your shoulder. I put the muscles on it. This is your, if you're wondering uh, what a rotator cuff looks like, you're looking at it. Okay? Uh, you basically have five rotator cuff muscles. Uh, four are shown here in the back, and this is the back part of a shoulder. This top, top one is called the supraspinatus, right there. This is called the infraspinatus, teres major, teres minor. Now, you guys don't need to remember that, but what you do need to remember is that these muscles right here, if you see what, they all come pretty much and attach to the end of your arm bone. They hold your arm bone in place. They keep it from rolling out of socket. Um, anybody ever have a shoulder dislocation? Okay. Uh, what did they, if you don't mind me asking, what did they uh, do for it? Did they put you in a sling or? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, was it, did you fell out of the tree or? No, I fell on a bicycle. Bicycle, okay, okay. <laughs> that can happen, you know. Well, th those muscles, once uh, that happens, if you, if you stretch the ligaments, once you stretch a ligament, it doesn't go back. It stays stretched. Um, so it's important if we have people with those kind of injuries that we get these muscles strong so they kind of take over as a primary restraint for holding your shoulder in place, okay? And what I'm talking about, I'm talking about a ball and socket joint so the ball doesn't roll out of it. Okay, this is the front of the shoulder, right shoulder in the front. Um, again, this shows a muscle you didn't see in the back. This is your subscapularis. This is a big muscle right here. You can't see it, you know. Uh, how many of you hunt? Okay, so you, you probably have seen this. You know, you can't see this unless you actually had somebody's shoulder blade there. You, know? you probably see these muscle striations in deer when you hunt, and it's very similar to that. So uh, this one comes and attaches to the, another prominence called lesser tubercle. And this is one of the muscles, uh, uh, Terry's major, that comes from the back. And they kind of hold the shoulder in in the front. So it's, it's kind of wrapped like a nice little package to hold your shoulder in there. Okay, and this is actually your biceps. Believe it or not, it extends into your shoulder. So your biceps actually helps hold your shoulder together. People think your bicep is just this ball right here, but it actually goes right up into your shoulder helps hold that together. So as physical therapists, we consider all of that when we're, uh, when we're treating you, try to get all that stronger. I've had people say, why am I doing curls when my shoulder hurts? I said, well, because we're trying to get it to, you know, hold together better. Okay. Uh, again, I told you before, this is the uh, end of your humerus, a uh, very round bone in a very small area. This is actually just an extension of it. So it's, it's hard. It's, if you think about it, um, it's almost easy if your muscles are really weak to dislocate your shoulder if you're doing things the wrong way. Okay, again, uh, the area that this bone goes on is called the, the fossa. This is where the uh, arm bone, the end of your arm bone, that big, big bony part uh, contacts. And what you have is an extension of that, like a washer, that comes out. We're actually looking at the shoulder from the side. I just take the 
arm bone out. And you have an extension of that, the way your body takes care of it is an extension like a washer that fills in the void. It keeps your, bone, your muscles from, or your uh, arm from rolling out of your socket. So, uh, everybody with me? Okay. <laughs> We're going to get to the good part, real good fun part here in a second. So if you hear a uh, labral tear at the doctor's, you'll, know, you'll remember this, what I showed. If you hear a glenoid fossa, you'll say, oh, I remember Ted showed me something like that. You really impress a doctor if you remember just a little bit. So, okay, uh, what we're, what we're uh, concerned about is the space that's right here in the front of your shoulder. You got so many things that run through here, people don't realize that. I'm going to go back here. This space right here, see this? This is your uh, collarbone. You got uh, your shoulder blade that comes around here, and you got so much stuff that goes through this little hole right here, okay? And your first rib, okay, right through that area. Okay, I'm going to go forward. And that's all, if you want to take a look at it, that's all the stuff that's got to go through there. So you wonder why, you know, if, if people are raising their, you know, lifting stuff over their head or going, climbing up and down a tree all the time you know, are using a lot of force. Now, you can have some uh, tingling in your hand. You can have some of these areas get pinched. Uh, you know, you got your nerves from your neck that run through here. You got your uh, arteries that run, veins that run back to your heart. Uh, you got all your rotator cuff muscles that I just pointed out. Uh, and you got your bursa sacs. Um, so, it's a lot of stuff. And you want to protect that area, and I'm going to show you how to protect it. Okay. Um, again, I, everything I just said is, is pretty much above this picture. The way your, your shoulder blade doesn't actually, let me start over. Your, um, in order to maintain that space, your shoulder blade has to rotate. Um, if you're lifting your arm up in front of you, your shoulder blade has to rotate back in order to maintain that space. If you're going out to your side, your shoulder blade has to rotate out to the side in order to maintain that space. And I'm going to show you here on the video. Okay, and what you have with me right here, I'm not blocking anybody. What you have with me right here is I'm just showing that space. When you raise that up, that has, my timing's a little off, but when you raise that up, that has to open up a little bit. And it's basically a ratio of, two, for every two degrees that your arm bone moves up past 90 degrees, your arm bone right here, your shoulder blade has to tilt back. Uh, one degree. Okay, and in a second here, it'll show you out to the side. Now, going out to the side, especially, will pinch it easier, you know, easier than going to the front. So that's got to open up. See, otherwise that space closes down. So I'm showing you where that, where that space opens up right here, right there it closed, and then you got to open it. So I'm just showing you. In, Slow motion. Okay, and also, this kind of gets ahead. The space, you can also close it off by rotating your arm in. So one of the positions that you're getting in when you're climbing, if you're not using those um, ascenders, is your arms turn in like this, and you're basically turning that shoulder in and pinching it. Not only that, sometimes you get it above 90 degrees. So you get it above 90 degrees, you turn it in, and you're putting force through it, and it can pinch all those areas in there. So I wouldn't be surprised if some of you, after you climb, may have a little bit of tingling, numbness in your hand. Okay, enough of that, I guess. You, you, you can. Uh, let me pause this. You actually can because who has that? <laughs> uh, because your scapula is on your rib cage. Okay. So if your scapula is not working right and vice versa, if your back's or ribcage is not working right, you'll compensate somewhere else. If I can't lift my arm up past a certain level, I'm going to extend my back, right? And if I do that over and over again, guess what? I'll feel it in my back. So. Okay, and then this is basically, we call this phenomenon shoulder impingement. So if you, say, if you go to the doc and he says, you got shoulder impingement, you can say, you know what? Ted came and talked to me about that uh, you know, February 2nd, and I, I kind of know what that is. Okay. Um, 
when you combine all of that, I notice that a, a lot of the arborists will have uh, the chainsaw. They'll use that. And there's vibration, for, you know, some vibration, vibrations from the chainsaw. So when you combine lifting your shoulder above your head, or lifting your arm above your head, turning it in, and also you have the vibration of a chainsaw, what you have happen is uh, that, that decreases the amount of blood flow to that area. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the instruments that, are, that use vibration have, have vibration coefficients. You can kind of look on the side of, uh, of the uh, chainsaw, you can see the vibration coefficient. And uh, you can look how much time it would take before it would be a hazard. You know, you look at the amount of vibration versus the amount of time. I mean, either one of these, you know, you can have a lot of vibration and have very little time that you're using something. Or you can have very little vibration if you use it for a long period of time, you can have problems. Okay, it just decreases any kind of, vib that kind of vibration up to a certain level decreases the amount of blood flow to the area and you can have problems. Okay. Um, now, I'm gonna, this is, like I said, the fun part. You guys get to watch arborists actually doing stuff. Um, I am actually going to show um, one of the arborists that I've uh, videotaped. Uh, and you, I, I'm, not even, I'm probably not going to say anything at the very beginning. I want you guys, I want to see the looks on your face when you see what positions, you know, that he gets his shoulder into doing things. And I want to, you know. Any questions? <laughs> Here we go. Now remember what I said about bringing your arm above shoulder level and internally rotating it. So watch there. It gets better as the video goes on. He's below shoulder level right there, but he's kind of in like that. Kind of raking. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah, he's going up there for that branch. That's, that's normal everyday work. Yeah. yeah, well, well, here's here's the uh, the way I want you to handle that. I want you to try again. Like I said, with the bull rider, there are certain variables you can't control. That's why I use that as an example. Um, you want to try to get, and here's an example, you want to try to get as close as you can to what you're working so you won't have to extend your arms. I mean, you know, you do the best you can with, uh, with what you have, you know. So I'm not saying it's going to be a perfect, you know, that, that there's a perfect way to do it. There is a better way to do it, you know, and to have that in mind that, if you do have a branch where you've got to um, reach out there, try to move the bucket closer to it so you're not having to put all the work on your shoulders. Or if, you're, you, know, if you can, if it's possible, to climb uh, and get closer to it and climb and get closer to it rather than trying to reach. So that's, that's the take-home message for all of this. Okay, and that's... And we'll get into the back issues later. <laughs> but uh, again, it, it shows example of that. Uh, I'll show you another example here of climbing. Okay, what I wanted to show with this is just an example of how, you know, when you're climbing, just if you're reaching up really high, how it's putting the pressure on that shoulder. And also, well, he's actually using the ascenders on this, and he's using a foot locking technique to get up there. We'll talk about the ankle with that too. And he's carrying a lot of weight with him. So that puts pressure on the stress on the shoulder, too. And that's basically the climbing. So the take-home message, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I want to let everybody. The take-home message is try to take shorter, uh, more strokes getting up the rope and shorter, rather than trying to go really long and get up there, if you can. Okay. Again, it's not perfect, but it's, it's better. <laughs> okay. 
Now, this is basically the same video. <laughs> Let me see here. Basically the same video. I'll just kind of um, underscore it by saying, basically, try to keep your shoulder in externally rotated position. And the way you do that, the best way I can see with what you guys are doing is, is to try to use the ascenders when you're going up. If you're not using the ascenders, then you're going to be grabbing the rope like this, and this externally rotates a little bit more. So I could decrease some of the variables, but I can't take all of them out. I'm going to keep going back to that bull rider example. <laughs> just saying it's, it's just not a perfect world. I wish it was. Okay, let's move on to that. Again, that's the same thing I said. Uh, I think I want to show, I think this might be the video with my four-year-old in it. I just want to, I was running short on manpower for my videos, and my four-year-old just wanted to show them off here. Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's in the, yeah, there he is. Name's Gavin, and uh, he helped me out by showing how an arborist would climb a pole. <laughs> okay, it shows what your body does. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he had fun with that. I think he had more fun with it than I did. Okay. All right. Uh, again, uh, it's important to use rope pulleys with the least amount of friction. You get a good, the greatest mechanical advantage pulling yourself up the tree. We were talking about vibration before. You want to use the, if you can. Again, this is what employers can do to help. Uh, you can use some vibration dampener gloves if that's a problem with, you know, for how long you're going to be up there. Now, you don't just look at the, you don't look at one single amount of time, you know, because you may say, well, I only do it for like three, four minutes at a time, but it's through an eight-hour day. So that three, four, five minutes can add up. Okay, so let's talk with everybody okay? <laughs> I'm going to try, I'm trying not to get too technical on everybody. Okay, uh, in the forearm, we're going to come back to the elbow. We made it to the shoulder. The shoulder was a big, big uh, area I wanted to cover. These other ones don't have as much content in them. Um, I want to also cover the back. Um, it doesn't have quite as much content. The shoulder, just if, if anybody's getting antsy, I just want to let you know it's going to go quicker. So uh, in the forearm, there are two bones. If you're looking at your hand and your arm, uh, the radius is on the thumb side of the bone, thumb side of your arm, and the ulna is on the pinky side. If you turn it like this, so when I'm talking about this, is with somebody standing like this. If you want to get some orientation, okay. Um, this is looking at your elbow with it facing that way, with the thumb out in the front. This picture is looking at the back of it. That would be your this would be your elbow right here, okay? Just wanted to show how your elbow basically consists of your arm bone and your radius and ulna. In the back, uh, this is your elbow. Call that the olecranon process. And uh, radius and ulna. So your elbow is actually part of your ulna. It is your ulna, okay? All right, this is just a side view. Basically, your, uh, your elbow is a hinge joint. But what's, what's interesting about it is that you, at your forearm, you can actually turn it. Your, your radius, the round bone on the, by your thumb, can actually rotate, okay, over here. So that's what gives you the ability to rotate your hands in to grab the rope. All right. Um, basically, your wrist either extends or flexes, okay? This shows you the uh, muscles that are responsible for extending and flexing it. This is basically the back part of the arm, and it shows you that the extensors basically uh, con connect to the lateral epicondyle, which is basically this notch on the outside of your arm. Okay, so that's what those muscles, those group of muscles, extend your wrist. These muscles right here flex your wrist, and you can see how they all kind of go through that sheath, and we'll talk a little bit about carpal tunnel here in a second, okay? You also have a sheath in the back, but it usually doesn't get as affected as the one in the front. All right, so that's, that, I just wanted to show you how, if you're talking about the wrist, you're also talking about the elbow, because those muscles extend across your wrist and your elbow. Yeah? Why does it always hurt here? And we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, get to that. Uh, that could be uh, with a with any pressure, I mean, I'm sure other, other guys have the same, other people have the same thing, but it always seems to be 
fair amount of tenderness in here when you apply any pressure. And that's a fairly common, that may, <clears throat> fairly common problem. That may be tennis elbow, okay? And uh, a lot of times you'll get, there's a muscle there. I'll show you here. Right there. Your extensor carpi radialis goes right through there. And that's where it attaches. And that's, you know, whenever you're grabbing something, you're having to stabilize that wrist too. So if you relax and grab, relax and grab, you're dealing with forces through there. You know, that's one factor. And you're dealing with repetition. And, you know, if you probably put a clicker on there, if you had a, a pedometer for your wrist, you'd probably see you did a couple miles, you know, and I, you know, going up and coming down. That's why I think those ascenders and the, are, are good or better than the alternative when you can. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and that's, you know, you were ahead of me right there. And <laughs> you did there, thank you. <laughs> so a lot of times, the, like I said, the wrist extensor and flexor tendons become inflamed with the high grip forces, okay, in the awkward positions. But that shows some of the positions that I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with that your wrist can get into. That's a neutral position. And that, again, when you're using the ascenders, it promotes keeping you in that neutral position. But when you're in these positions right here, it bunches all the muscles up and uh, also, just like we were talking about the shoulder in the front of the shoulder, it could pinch there also, okay? Now, I wanted to, it, I, I need a volunteer, someone with a really strong grip, which is probably everybody in this room if they're climbing up and down trees. Any volunteers? Don't be shy. Go on once, go on. Okay. Okay, this is a hand dynamometer. This is how we measure hand strength. Uh, hey, what's your name? Uh, John Wayne. Okay, hey, nice to meet you. How's the next movie going? <laughs> um, all right, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure his strength on this, and there will be a little measure here where, he's, where John is squeezing this hand dynamometer, and we'll see what, what it goes up to. And then I'm going to have him bend his wrist and squeeze it. And you'll see how inefficient it is, uh, you know, how, how much less it is when you're squeezing in different positions. So I'll probably have him bend his wrist, probably do this and squeeze it, and you'll see different values come up. Okay. So I want you to face the, face the audience here. All right. Okay. Now, I want you to go ahead and squeeze that as hard as you can for about three seconds and relax. Okay. All right. About 100, 405, and you base it on somebody's weight. <laughs> you know, uh, I would expect a, a bigger, heavier guy who would squeeze a percentage of his weight too. But we're going to go with that number, 104. All right. Now, I want you to bend your wrist like that and squeeze it in that position. Okay. And let's stop. Okay. Any guesses of what he, how much less it was? Yeah. Good guess. <laughs> I'm going to say that's why I don't play poker. <laughs> Uh, it's 55, 55 pounds, so half. So he exerts half the force he could with his wrist straight. So what does that tell you about climbing a tree or climbing the rope? You know, so thanks. <laughs> Wait for John's next movie to come out here. Okay. All right, this is what you're talking about. <laughs> there are a couple different uh, syndromes here. This is what you're talking about. What's your name? Aaron. Aaron, this is what you're talking about right here. This would be tennis elbow. The common extensor tendon. That's the outside part of the elbow. Um, and that's what happens when that, you just get a lot of force to that area and a lot of repetition. And you have microscopic, um, you have microscopic tears that occur in there. And uh, what we usually do with physical therapy is we'd have you come in first order business just to show you stretches. You can actually come in for a free 15-minute consult. We'll show you some stretches and uh, see if that doesn't do it. Have you, you know, maybe uh, take an ice cup, take a Dixie cup, fill it up with water, freeze it, take the uh, top part off, and you rub it on there until it gets numb a couple times a day. If that doesn't go away with, you know, your ibuprofen, then that's when we see whether you might seek some further treatment, okay? All right, so this is the, uh, these are the flexor muscles that actually flex your wrist, and you can have what we call golfer's elbow. Everybody see that? 
Okay. And that's just basically very similar to tennis elbow, but it's on the other side. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can also, let's see, I guess they're not showing it here. You can have, you have nerves that run through here, okay, your median nerve, right through, right around where that notch is on your elbow, uh, that sometimes can get pinched, and that's called cubital tunnel syndrome, okay. And so that's where a lot of times, sometimes we have to differentiate between whether somebody has carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel syndrome, all right. So if you have anything like that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to some of the, um, signs and symptoms, don't just live with them. Give us a call. Come on in, get a, get a free consult, you know, so we can help you. Okay, now we'll talk about carpal tunnel. Um, you basically have uh, three major nerves that go through your arm. Two of them go through your wrist, the median nerve. The median nerve is on the same side as your radius. It's on your thumb, where your thumb is. And it uh, pretty much controls your first three fingers. Sometimes we call that the six shooter. So if anybody, if you come in and the doctor says, you know, uh, what's going on, say my six shooter is, uh, you know, that's what you remember what I said. But I mean, you'll remember it just because I said that though. Okay, because you'll know where this is. This is. All right. So uh, your ulnar nerve is on the inside of your arm here. Again, it's the ul, because it's called ulnar nerve. And uh, it actually controls your pinky and your ring finger. Okay. So uh, a lot of times you'll have uh, pitching at your wrist where you will be able to tell which nerve it is by where you're feeling the symptoms, okay? Anybody feeling that, you know, or have felt that, have you? Has it been on the, uh, have you? Has it been on the uh, thumb side or both? Yeah. yeah, and that's pretty much a typical pattern because a lot of times you're not, people aren't paying attention to it when they're climbing you know, when they're climbing the rope. It's, it's usually when you're, when you're at rest. Okay. Uh, sometimes a rope will press against the carpal tunnel too. All right, doing okay. Okay, so here's some things. We don't know everything about carpal tunnel. Uh, we do see some, uh, some uh, similar characteristics with people who get it. But here's some of the factors. Um, you can have a different bone structure. You can actually be smaller in that area. More flexibility. Some people have just more flexibility than other people. Uh, here's, here's an interesting fact. Women are three times more common than men. How many women arborists do we have here? That was a rhetorical question. So, uh, this may be something to, to look at. Uh, ages between 30 and 60. Okay, uh, differences of anatomy. Again, I said that with the person's bone structure. Uh, hormonal factors. Um, again, this comes with um, women too. They, they're fluctual hormones. They can actually make you have more, um, more inflammation. Injuries to that area, disease, arthritis, gout, or diabetes, and then also this is what we can control. So that's what we're looking to control through physical therapy and with the medical part. Okay, that's the part we do understand. And that's why I'm here today. Here's some signs and symptoms, which I, so many people have already said in the room they have. Uh, numbness, tingling, pain, deep ache, burning, swelling, weakness, sweating, decreased sweating, sensitivity to cold, especially in Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, symptoms, hand is clumsy, you drop things, wakes up at night with pain. Uh, arthritis type symptoms, hand, hand gets numb when driving. Okay. Uh, here's what we do, okay? I, I will tell you we don't do acupuncture and acupressure, but that's one of the things that people have done and have found success with. Uh, we'll do ice, ultrasound. If you get to this point where you get past the 15 minute evaluation, we say, okay, well, let's see where we go from here. Uh, massage and exercise. The simplest thing to do, exercise is portable. It's like your little toolbox. You can take it out anytime you want and stretch. So I, I tell people that's your most portable tool you can use is your mind. You know, you know how to do these stretches. Um, sometimes the docs at OSI will do, if it gets to a certain point, this is after like when it gets really chronic, if it's been months and we've been trying everything and it hasn't been worked, sometimes they'll do cortisone injections and use medication. Um, the most extreme thing you can do, obviously, is surgery. And we are seeing that there's some vitamin B6 deficiencies. The, the, the verdict is not totally end on that, but 
in on that, we are seeing some vitamin B6 deficiencies with people who do get it. So, uh, one of the things I do for screening when you come in is a Tinel sign. What we do is we see where the, uh, where the nerve is, and I actually tap on the uh, median nerve to see if you get any tingling in there, and that'll give, that's a positive. The Phelan sign, sometimes what we'll do is put people's wrists together, and if you hold it there for about uh, 60 seconds, and you start to get some tingling if I have you hold it like that. You could actually probably test yourself at home with the things I'm seeing, I'm showing you. Uh, and that's usually a positive. Okay, you got to watch how you're holding your shoulder, though, because it might be pinching at your shoulder. Uh, CAT scan, um, which is basically an x-ray. They take different dimensions of it. EMG, uh, where they look at the nerves, and nerve conduction velocity test, where they actually will put, they'll put like a probe here and here and see how quickly it goes how quickly the electrical current goes from down here to up. So, okay, the knee. Anybody need a stretch break? You guys want to stand up and doing okay? Okay. All right, ligaments in the knee. This always, uh, especially after the Super Bowl, uh, and luckily we didn't have too many, I don't think we had anybody get hurt at the Super Bowl. But uh, especially when people see their favorite athletes get hurt and they hear about ACL, ACL injury. Um, it basically, your ACL, if people can see, what you do is you look. This is the back side of a left knee, okay? The back side. So this is right in the bend of your knee, okay, if I bent it like that. And if you look at the ACL, it is right there. And it goes from the outside in. And so it basically uh, keeps your, if you stop, it keeps your tibia, your lower leg bone, from going forward and shooting out, you know? And uh, where people get in trouble, a lot of times the athletes will get in trouble, is when they plant like that, and then they twist. That, and then they take off. And if they get hit like that, or if the knee goes in, uh, that's when they have an injury. So I just thought, if anybody's wondering what they say on NFL football. But anyway, the ligaments of the knee, you basically have uh, the lateral collateral ligament, medial collateral ligament, ACL, and the PCL. It just basically keeps your, when you stop going backwards, keeps your lower leg bone from going back, flying out the back, <laughs> okay? Holds it all together. Okay, what people don't realize is that the upper leg bone, the femur, has two little notches on the end, and your lower leg bone, the tibia, is flat. So you got a problem, because you're trying to have a, a round bone be on a flat bone. And so the way that your body deals with that as you, again, I'm going to refer to this washer concept. You got two little washers in there called menis, menis, menisci is the plural, but it's a meniscus. You got a lateral and inside and outside meniscus. And these can also get, uh, these can get injured depending upon how you land. Okay, I'm going to go through this real quick. Uh, you guys probably already know a lot of this. You got your, over here for the muscles, you have your quadriceps. This is the front of a right knee. You have your quadriceps, which extends your knee. You have your hamstrings back here, which bend your knee. Those are the two major muscles. <laughs> you have your uh, quad tendon and your patellar tendon. Sometimes you can get uh, quad tendonitis or patellar tendonitis. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I wanted to show you the different directions on this video that um, your knee can get in when you're, especially if you're foot locking, going up the rope. Uh, the foot ascenders will basically keep your foot um, Foot ascenders and descenders will keep your foot in a neutral position. Okay? Okay, so this will be the front of the knee. And that's showing you, that's the outside part of the knee. If you were foot locking, uh, and it doesn't, I was just exaggerating to show which ligament that is. If you're foot locking, you're going up the rope, that's a ligament you're putting the, uh, the stress on, that ligament right there. And you can see the meniscus right in there too. So I wanted to give you a kind of a 3D angle of it, what's happening when you're actually going up and down a tree. Now obviously it doesn't move that far, it's like that. Okay, this right here is the ACL. And it's PCL coming that way. But they're actually, I made it real, I mean this, this uh, actual model has a torn ACL and PCL because somebody moved it too far, so it's pretty realistic. 
Okay, that's showing you how you can hyperextend your knee and still tear the ACL and PCL. So if you kind of land awkwardly and you hyperextend your knee, that can happen. Now, the first thing that happens is probably you get a muscle sprain because your muscles are the first thing that are affected. But if it goes too far, like some of you guys have probably seen on some of the sports highlight reels and, you know, some people going too far in football, that's what can happen. Now, this is how you can injure your meniscus. You can actually land, and when you're done landing, say, you know, I did everything Ted told me to do. I'm, you get, all right, okay, I'm going to take off this way. And if you do that and you're twisting, uh, if you do it just right, you can actually injure your meniscus. Okay. Okay, I think you guys have the concept with that. Oh, yeah, actually this shows, again, the upper angle of the meniscus and how the leg bones fit in there. A lot of people don't realize there's that much in their knee. And that's what happens when you're squatting or bending. They keep everything in place. So. Okay. Again, this kind of, uh, this just shows one landing. He's actually landing right, but it, the video that says basically you should land right. You should land slow. You know, good position. Anybody, anybody know who's, who's, who's my actor? Okay. Okay. Here's a foot locking technique. Just play that video in your mind of what was happening to that ligament on the outside of your leg when you're climbing up like this. So now we, we've gone from the shoulder to the knee. We're showing how it. Okay. Okay, this is just, uh, I um, just wanted to uh, make this point. It's important to be flexible. It's important to be flexible in your quadriceps, your hamstrings, um, all your lower leg muscles when you're going up and down the rope because you want to keep normal range of motion. If you don't have full range of motion, it puts more pressure through your uh, ligaments and joints and it makes you more prone to injury. Okay, now the ankle. Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to this. The ankle is, is uh, composed of the forefoot, which is your toes and, and uh, your metatarsals right here. So this would be your forefoot. Okay. It actually bears half of your body weight. Okay. Uh, midfoot, which are these tarsal bones, and you have your hind foot, which is basically the tibia, the fibula, um, your calcaneus, and your, uh, I can't think of it right now. But uh, anyway, the foot, the, basic, the midfoot basically functions as a shock absorber. So this will be important when you land. Uh, and then basically, your forefoot basically balances you. So this is balance. This is shock absorption, and your rear foot basically stays pretty rigid. Talus, that's the word I was looking for. That's your talus. Okay, the uh, ankle forms a hinge joint. Uh, it joins the, the talus. That's called your talocrural joint right through here. And then you have your uh, subtalar joint which is right through here where your hind foot joins your midfoot. And then your uh, rear foot, again, is your calcaneus. You got a layer of fat right there. Okay. Now, um, the stability of your ankle is pretty good when your ankle's kind of like at 90 degrees, when it's just you're walking on the ground. But you get into trouble when you get your foot pointing down, okay? Because what happens is you take all the bones of your foot and you separate them, and they're just hanging there by the ligaments at that point. So the only thing holding it together at that point, or what really holds it together, is your ligaments and your muscles. And so you're putting a lot of pressure on there. Uh, and especially when you have the spurs going up and down there, that adds another dimension. So I want to show you um, a foot. What happens, so you can see visually what happens when a foot comes out of that angle. 
Okay. So I want you to especially look at the separation of the bones here. Those are all ligaments holding that together. So when you're climbing and you're going up and down the tree, it's important to have strong ankle muscles, foot muscles, have them flexible so they can take those, uh, take those pressures. All right. Again, um, I wanted to emphasize that when you use the spurs, it puts uh, even more pressure on it, which is okay, but you need to uh, make sure your ankle is stretched and is strong. Okay, so I'm going to show you, basically the ankle is, the ankle is uh, supported by six structures. Um, the anterior tail of fibular ligament is the most often sprained ligament. It's right here in the front of your ankle, front and kind of a little bit lateral. Okay, it's the most often sprained one. Uh, the calcaneal fibular is the second most sprained. That's the one on the side. It runs from that. If you reach down, you feel that little bony part on the outside of your ankle. If you go down straight from there to the bottom of your foot, that's where the calcaneal fibular ligament runs. Okay. Uh, the posterior talofibular fibular ligament, oops, go back here. And this is on the, I'm showing you all the ones on the outside pretty much right now, on the outside of your ankle. Um, this is the one in the back, and it runs to your uh, heel bone. All right. And then there's a ligament that connects your two leg bones, or your tibia and fibula. It's called a syndesmotic lig ligament. Okay, and then if you look on the inside of your ankle, you got what we call the deltoid ligament. And I'm not going to go through all the ligaments there. We just call it generally the deltoid ligament because it looks like the Greek letter delta. So those are all that I just wanted to make that point. When you're climbing up and down the rope and using that foot locking technique, you're actually compressing your deltoid ligament and you're stretching your other ligaments on the outside, you know. So that's why it's important to try to keep your uh, ankle at a neutral angle. The first 24 hours, you want to ice it because you got bleeding. You want to stop bleeding, okay? It's microscopic bleeding, but you got bleeding. So that's, that's your goal. Um, after that, after the first 24 hours, um, you want to probably stretch it. I wouldn't necessarily say heat, okay, at that point because the heat will cause, if you got swelling, it will cause it to swell more and it will balloon up, especially ankles because you got so much running through there, sort of like your shoulder. So I'd probably initially you want to get it on ice as much as you can. Um, even though, I'm, like I said, I'm not a pharmacist, but, you know, take your anti, take your anti-inflammatories, okay, and then, uh, then you start exercising a little bit. Okay, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to kind of blast through these right here. This is your uh, calf or your gastroc. It's responsible for prope propelling you up the tree. You got a muscle that a lot of people don't know about it that's underneath this that actually comes and supports the arch of your foot it actually is responsible for reloading your foot when you're going up down a tree. So it actually, uh, it's called a tibialis, posterior tibialis. Uh, I thought this would be funny. <laughs> you have to be careful with awkward landings. So. Okay, spine is the last thing. Um, spine consists of seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae. Okay, and you have, uh, I'm sorry, I should put, sacral is your, I mean, uh, cervical is your neck, thoracic is here, and lumbar vertebrae, and you got your sacrum right here. And then your, your uh, if, has anybody fallen on their tailbone out of the tree that they're willing to admit it? Okay. <laughs> Slipped into Wisconsin ice. Okay. Your vertebrae, when you're looking at the top of them, they have a body to them, and they have a hole in the middle of them where your spinal cord goes through. So if I was looking at the top of somebody's head like that and I could see through it, the x-ray, that's the way it looks. Uh, your ver your, believe it or not, your spinal cord only goes down. You have five lumbar vertebrae. It only goes down to the second. So it doesn't go all the way down, you know, to your tailbone. 
Okay. Uh, you have the nerve roots that come out of the side of your spine that actually, when they're together up here, they're called plexus. You know, your lumbar plexus. Um, they're a group of nerves that tell your arms, or your, or your brachial plexus tells your arms to move. Your lumbar plexus tells your, your legs to move. Okay. There's a disc in between this, which we call the, the uh, it's got a encased by connective tissue called the annulus fibrosus, and it's got nucleus pulposus in there, which is a soft, it's like a, a, a jelly donut. And I wanted to show you, I, if you guys could stick around, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this, uh, I got two more slides, and I've got a good uh, example of uh, twisting your back in the wrong way, a uh, good arborist example of doing that. So if you could hang on, probably about five more minutes, I'll play that video, okay? Okay, so this was what happens in between your vertebrae when you bend. They separate. This is a jelly donut right here, and the jelly goes out the back. So these are your vertebrae, L4. The most, one of the most common areas to have an injury is at L4. And you see that little red. Actually, this has a little red part that's sticking out that tells you where it sticks, sticks out. If you basically, if you bend over a whole bunch of times not using your legs, or if you have one time where you're lowering something to the ground and you twist and you bend really heavy, um, or if you just stand, people don't realize this, when you're driving around in your park and rec trucks or your arborist trucks for a long period of time, if you don't have something behind your back keeping that arch in your back, the same thing happens. It just happens slowly. It just kind of drifts like, like molasses. It kind of drifts to the back, and that jelly can start to poke out of that donut. Okay, so I think you guys have seen that enough. Uh, and then that's what can, this basically shows the fibers that are around that jelly, and this is what can happen if you keep doing it, you know, if you do it over and over again over time. It starts to uh, press out. It'll push on one of those nerves coming out to the side and you can have what they call a herniated disc. Okay, and then sometimes depending upon, depending upon where it's pressing, I can do it like if somebody was um, trying to find out whether they're, where the circuit breaker was going. You say, okay, flip this one. You say, that's the kitchen. Flip this one. Okay, that's the living room. We can almost do that when you come to see us. If you say, wow, I got pain right here and right here. I say, well, you got something going on in L1. Or I got pain right here and, you know, somewhere in the front right here. So, oh, you got L3, you got L3 thing going on. So we can kind of tell, just like a mechanic, if he listens to a car and says, oh, yeah, you got something in number four cylinder. Okay, so it's important basically to keep your spine in the S position, in a neutral position. And this basically tells you how not to lift. You guys have already been over a lot of that. How not to lift and how to lift. <laughs> and here we go. This is the last thing. I will play this one through, and I'm going to see how you guys react to this. This is my last video. With what I told you about the back. It's bad position <coughs> because he's bending at his back. Or else you're going to bend. Well, reason he needs to get the bucket truck as close as he can to what he's cutting, so he won't have to bend as far. Again, we're not look we're not looking at perfect, but we're looking at better. Yeah. Okay. And this guy's with the yeah, that's that, that. I thought I'd include that one. I don't even have to say anything about that, do I? <laughs> This is the Wisconsin snow shoveling position. <laughs> but you got to understand, the guy with the shovel there is six foot seven. Yeah. <laughs> now the thing is, is that you're, if he if he uh, bends his knees, um, his knee, his legs are going to get sore. Okay. 
but his legs can recover. I don't know how well his back can recover. It takes a lot longer to recover from that. He'll get sore for a while. Um, the other thing is, is if you're looking at ergonomic shovels, some of those shovels that kind of go like that, again, I'm not, the, the easiest thing to do is change your position and not spend anything, <laughs> okay, and do some exercise. Exercises cost you nothing. Well, again, you have to pick and choose. You know, as people say, you have to pick and choose your battles. <laughs> you have to pick and choose the most important things, the things that are obvious. I mean, this right here is really going to mess up somebody's back because they're lifting a lot of weight and they're bending there. So that would be the one I'd focus on. Now, this is one, too. Um, he's twisting. See, if you add another element of twisting, you're actually taking that... Uh, taking that um, disc and you're wringing it out like a rag. When you twist and lift, you're, wringing, you're not only compressing it and pushing the jelly to the back, but you are wringing it out. You, if I get people to do this, sometimes I'll get, they'll have pain, a lot of their pain to one side or the other. They go, I just got right leg pain in my right back. And I can kind of tell them which side they've been shoveling to if they tell me that. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, well, yeah, the best thing to do, again, pick your battles. Try to balance the load the best you can. Try to balance your load. Okay. It's hard for me to see from this angle. I'm going to move over here. Hope I'm not blocking anybody. I'm going to point out something. I think that's the same person, too. <laughs> he will remain nameless, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he has been in his knees. So, again, you pick and choose what's the most important thing to do or to avoid. Okay. Um, I'm kind of running short of time here, guys. I'm going to move on. Uh, you can actually, uh, this is probably to the employers as well as employees. Um, you can come to our website and for a, minimal, a nominal fee, which I haven't set yet, you can actually purchase the, video, the uh, exercise videos of the exercises that are particularly suited for the arborist. Okay? Um, you can also come, like I said, to Advanced PT and Sports Medicine, give us a call, and you can uh, set up a 15-minute sports screen or injury screen, and that's no charge to you. Okay? So that is everything.